this week it's week five of the crossing the desert series and we're looking at what it means to be on a journey and right at the very beginning of this series when i was asked to produce this piece of work it didn't feel right to create a canvas that was stretched on a wooden frame so right at the very beginning it felt that this needed to be on a long piece of fabric that could be rolled up and that could travel with us wherever we worship whatever we're doing it's coming with us and it'll be part of Threshold and to show our history but also to show our journey and all the things that God has taught us along the way and as well it reminds us of of the Israelites and how they were freed from captivity uh, from the Egyptians and how God led them into a new freedom it meant them being in the wilderness for a long time but even so it was a freedom from slavery and that journey although it was really hard for them and every day they had to totally surrender to God totally surrender themselves and rely on him for all that they needed from the food that they ate to the direction that they traveled they knew that they could trust in him so it was in him that they found the freedom not in um, land um, or that they could possess and where they could live. They knew even on a journey they could rely on him and have freedom in him. And we know that um, when they were travelling, God provided the direction through putting a cloud in the sky during the day and a pillar of flame by night. And so this week I thought that to keep it simple, we would just have along the whole length of the piece um, some stitches that I've put some little beads here that uh, are to depict the clouds the cloud in the sky each day and then I just put a little red cross because really um, to show that's to show the pillar of flame pillar of fire but really God was showing his unending love for the Israelites whenever he put those signs in the sky he was saying I love you so that's why I chose to put a cross stitch he was saying that he loved them and each day they put his their trust in him in return showing their love for him and their dependence and so for our cairn stone you can see the fourth one it's a combination of the beads to show the cloud that they followed and also the cross there um, to show God's love for them in the pillar of flame, pillar of fire. So um, there's just a couple of weeks left now and uh, so I'll keep working on it this coming week and update you again next Sunday. Have a good week everyone. Good morning, Threshold. Really good to see you and uh, to know you're there. It's a lovely morning here today. It's uh, just absolutely gorgeous. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today is the fourth stone in our cairn or way marker, which is about journey or about movement. Uh, I love the way Anne has just uh, portrayed it in the textile piece that she's doing. I love the continuous line of stitching, which represents the the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud through which God guided his people all through the time of the Exodus. It meant that he was always with them, always leading them and taking them to the next step. It also meant that they weren't to stay static, they were to move when he asked them to move. We started this topic earlier this week and on Tuesday's morning bell, looking at what journeys might mean to us as individuals and in the light of Jesus calling us to follow him, which generally means movement, and not just stay still, not just stay static. So on Tuesday we looked at what it means for us individually, but today I want to look more at what it means for us as a community. Learning from the exodus of the Jews from Egypt, from as they came away from slavery, and as they made their journey to the Promised Land, that epic journey over 40 years. Just a few simple points to make to begin with. The first is that God initiated the journey and made it possible by freeing them from slavery. It wasn't something they dreamed up, it was his initiative. 
Secondly, they made the journey together as a people, something like 600,000 of them probably, divided into the divisions, if that makes sense, into their clans and families they journeyed together. Now I guess they made assumptions, the bell, as to how long the journey would last, but had no real idea. And I guess they guessed at the route they would take, but they would have been wrong. And none of them, not one, had seen the place they knew they would eventually call home. So they were travelling into an unknown place over an unknown period of time by an unknown route. And on the way, in that time of uncertainty, they learnt to be a community in God. Firstly, he taught them that he was central. He was to be central to them in their worship and prayer. And he was in their midst, not just visible in the fire and the cloud, but in the tabernacle where the glory of the Lord shone, particularly when Moses was there. And he taught them to keep festivals. He taught them to keep the Passover, the Passover, the Feast of Weeks, other festivals as well in their, in their year, in their annual cycle of devotion to him. Secondly, he gave them the Ten Commandments so that they would know how to put him central and how to do life with each other, how to treat each other fairly and justly and kindly and make room for aliens and strangers in their midst as well. He guided their journey, thirdly, he guided their journey through pillars of fire and cloud so that when the pillar moved, they moved. When it stopped, they stopped. It was a day-to-day -day discernment of where he was going and going with him. Then he provided for them. He provided for them water, manna and quail. They learned that when they couldn't provide for themselves, God provided for them all that they needed. And he protected them. Do you remember the fight with the Amalekites? With uh, Moses up on the hillside like this, with Aaron one side, her and the other, supporting him. Uh, a, uh, a symbol of how God was supporting him and was with the troops, the Jewish troops, as they were eventually victorious against the Amalekites. He protected them. So that's what they learnt from God as they moved together across this desert landscape. And our life together is to be not particularly different. I mean, the landscape is, is changed, hasn't it? It's not a desert exactly, but it's unfamiliar. And as we travel across this really strange terrain, um, God will teach us how we should do life together, not just for now, but for further ahead. And that's what we've been looking at, isn't it? So just like the Jews, we need to be conscious and committed to the presence of God. We're to keep him central in prayer and worship and celebrate our fulfillment of the Passover, as in breaking bread together, and fulfill the first commandment, which is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Secondly, we have his word, not just the Ten Commandments and the law, we have the New Testament, we have the Gospels, we have the teaching of the Epistles, and we're to live the way, live life the way God commands, based on the scripture, again, in order to create, create a fair and just community and society and to treat each other well, and to relate wholesomely and appropriately to those who are not part of the household of faith. Thirdly, as we learned last week, it's his community and we're to love our neighbours as ourselves. We're to include people, not exclude people. We're to act justly and kindly and caringly. And then today, what we're looking at is the journey. We're to follow him. We have to move, but not randomly. We follow him. We need to navigate as he leads and guides, listening to his voice daily. And like with the Jews, we can trust him to provide for us too. There may be difficult times ahead, economically, I think, in this country, but we can trust him to provide for us when we can't help ourselves. And he will also protect us and deliver us from evil, as we've prayed every day. So the Jews, as a community, were God's plan to form a holy nation from whom the rest of the world could be blessed and from whom the rest of the world could learn how to do life with God. And this journey was to shape them for this as well as take them to the land in which they would live. And now it's for us, for the church, to do the same. As we travel together, so the way we travel and what we learn as we travel will shape our future. And that's really, really important. The first thing I think we need to note in terms of the way ahead is it's part of being an apostolic church. An apostle is one who is sent. You can't be sent without moving. We need to obey Jesus' command to go. 
to take the adventure that he sends us on. And firstly, we need to go locally. We need to engage with people, with our local community, with the culture that we're in, and follow God, see what he's asking us, asking of us in that context. One of the reasons we added um, journey to the cairn as a stone is because we're aware that we're all at risk of being static, of getting fossilized in the way we do church, of gradually becoming dislocated culturally from the community around us. And it's not that some of the ancient ways of being church are not beautiful or lovely for those who are used to it, that's the case. But actually it becomes increasingly distant from where most people are at, especially in a country where 95% of the population don't regularly attend church. We need to keep a culture that folks can relate to in the way we do life and in the way we do life when we, when we gather. It's not just about avoiding fossilization, however, it's about being obedient to God's call to go. And one of the, way, one of the reasons, again, we put journey in this can is because our call is to a county, not just to the locations we're already in. We're, we're called away, I'm quoting now, we're called away to flexibility and movement together, not a static existence which centers on buildings and fixes us geographically, there does need to be commitment to particular localities, villages, parts of the city maybe, following the call of God. But there also needs to be a willingness to be sent, to go, to be apostolic to new places, creating flow and dispersion and moving out, following the Spirit as He leads across a region and beyond. We need to allow Him to bring up springs and life in the way He knows each context that we are involved in needs. Threshold foundational scriptures speak of movement and flow, don't they? So in Psalm 84, the valley of Baca turns green as the pilgrims journey across it, heading for the dwelling place of God. In Ezekiel 47, the river of life comes from under the throne down into the valley, bringing transformation, brings life, trees, healing, fruit, fish. We're called to be centrifugal, to move out, not to suck in. We're going to move out and not be static. We're called away to see the kingdom of God extend across a region, not build one local congregation. <clears throat> Even our name, Threshold, speaks of this. A threshold in Latin is a limen. You've heard of liminal space. It's the sense of being on the move, of having left the last room we were in, like on a threshold, but not having yet entered the next one. It's a place of constant change, of transition so that we're moving, following God, and not being fossilized in one place. So I guess one of the questions is, how do we love and serve other villages? And I guess it's about supporting other Christians in those places, maybe being those in them ourselves as God leads. Maybe there's room for something else as well in the future. Sarah, as in our daughter Sarah, had a picture in the last week or two that we needed a new mobilization, not just our church, but the Christians in this country. And she saw a picture of a, an armored vehicle like a Land Rover, which is rapidly deployable, readily able to move quickly over different terrain. And she saw this as being the church needing to be ready to respond to mission, to battles or humanitarian needs at given notice, as something which will carry troops on mission on the instruction of the commander, like that, on the go, like Jesus and his disciples, being able to go from one place of mission to another fairly quickly at his command. It's a place where we need spiritual protection, we need to be ready for land to be taken back and many to be won for him. It's a rescue mission. So there's that, that dimension which we may see. But I think there are other dimensions as well. Now you'll be aware on Tuesday at the morning bell I asked you, if you wish to, to send in a photo with a comment. A photo representing something of a journey you've previously been on and the comment to be something about what you've learnt whilst on that journey. That's what I want to go on to now. One of the scriptures God used to help us understand about this time we're now in was from Isaiah 48, the whole uh, passage about returning from exile. And one of the things God says to his people in Isaiah 48 is that remember, remember the time when you came back across the desert from Egypt, as in the Exodus, where I provided for you and I provided water in the desert. So sometimes remembering helps us have courage about the future and sometimes it can actually be prophetic about what the future will be like. Sometimes there are elements of what we remember that we ha that are yet to come and as I read through many of these comments that you made actually the thought occurred to me some of this is just straight prophetic it's about how things will be not just how things were. 
we need to carefully pray over this, but I'm going to read you my distillation of some of these comments now. <coughs> so, these are the comments. My journey set in motion all my adventures in God since. He does the inviting, but the choice to go is always ours, and we can never know the full consequences of, of each of our small yeses. Secondly, God has been preparing me for that journey, and one since, and one's yet to come, from the start. None of us could have predicted where we are today. Are we ready for the challenges ahead? But it was here I heard, felt, saw, was nudged and flung at the same time into my calling, into my journey, my calling. Someone referred in their comments to the journey they were referring to was a journey that enlarged my heart and my family. Others said I learned how to live in close community, found my still, still place and inspiration for a whole way of life and actually a life partner in that instance. The first weekend away we spent together was what the picture depicted. It's so lovely to see how the friendship between our two families has grown over the years. I learned to appreciate things around me, the beauty of God's creation, stripped back to the bare basics and how community is important anywhere, even in the most rural places. Someone said, having depicted the photo of the entrance to Statham Lodge, it reminds me somehow of God's front door. It's always open. There's great fellowship, worship and safety within, and lots of nourishment too. Someone from Romania said, I can't give until I've received from God first. And trusting him is like trusting that oxygen will flow into my lungs when I breathe. I don't know how it happens, but it's essential. A spirit of exploration leading to crossing striding edge needed courage and strength and stamina needed for some parts of the journey which was well learnt needing to rely on god for everything this was someone in australia we had an unbelievable time someone else when you lose your material props and have to rely on others you discover even the birds needs are met perseverance in exploration led to discovery of family members we didn't know existed. Now how about considering that God may be speaking to us now through each other, which is one of the key things we're trying to encourage during this time. The summary of all that would be God will be with us, he's prepared us, he's with us on the way, we'll provide as we go, provide spiritually, physically in every way. It will open up a way to a different way of life, a lot of emphasis on community, a lot of emphasis on doing life together. Really important, I think. So thank you so much for contributing and those who've contributed since I recorded this because I had to do it slightly early. So what in the light of all this will the road ahead look like? Well, the landscape will be characterized by a series of things which I think we can see already. Firstly, in society generally, there'll be a lot of nervousness or anxiety, particularly about safety uh, related to health and the virus. There'll be nervousness about education and should children and young people be in their places of education now or not. There'll be anxiety about work, whether we've got work or not. Anxiety therefore about finances. And there'll be changes in home life as well. I think it will feel different because more people will be at home more often. And that brings its own pressures as well as its own joys. There'll be changes in life at home. I think there'll be changes in education, in healthcare, business, social activity, travel will all look really different. I think we'll live more locally, physically, but more globally, digitally. So we'll live, work, relate more locally than we have been, but we resource by a much wider com international community as we work across the nations with different different aspects of work, different aspects of life. Some, not all will do that. I think uh, some will retreat into online stuff. Others won't go near it. So there'll be a spectrum there. Unfortunately, I think because of the uh, effect of the virus, there will be much less money. There'll be increased unemployment, increased poverty, and increased dependence on a now more impoverished state. So the church is really gonna have to step up into some of that gap and provide 
where it cannot be provided by the state, even more than we did in 2008 and the years of austerity that followed. More immediately, there will be changes for us in our life as a church, or continuation perhaps of the changes we've already seen. Uh, the government announcement this week means that um, at least for the next six weeks until the beginning of the July, uh, churches cannot meet or gather in large numbers. Uh, so we will continue to be doing this online and gathering in our small groups online. So how do we do life together when we can't physically gather is more and more of a question. And I guess one of the answers to that is that we more and more have to do life in our smaller groupings and our community focused groupings. So it's really important to develop those, continue to develop those. It's also likely that the small gatherings will be allowed to happen maybe months before we can gather as a whole church. So for that reason too, we really need to develop our small group life and make sure everybody feels part of something with people they can do life with. We've been doing morning prayer every weekday morning here in Bardley with five households and it's, it's life-giving, it's really good. So complements what we're doing as a whole church with Morning Bell and our Sunday mornings. It's, uh, we can share each other's you know, challenges, we can rejoice when good things are happening, we can pray for family members, we can plan mission in the village together, we can keep an eye on people we're concerned about. So it's all very, very healthy. And um, I think I would say from Exodus, we mustn't bottle it threshold, we mustn't pull back from what God calls us to do at this time. We don't want to miss out like they did in Exodus uh, because of failure of our courage or even disobedience when it looks difficult. We've got to meet the challenges that lie ahead and do the difficult things. I think households will become ever more important, especially as they relate to the households around them and immediate neighbours. And so I think we do need to learn from the monastics, as others have said, and Kath particularly when she did her morning bell on Monday, looking at Lindisfarne. We need to learn from the monastics of the past, as well as the contemporary ones, because I think they have a lot to teach us about how to do life in these changed circumstances. We, know, we need to learn to live simply, to share resources, to welcome the stranger, to live in rhythms of prayer and worship and learning and study, to live in a place where we are caring for the poor, healing the sick, being a source of compassion and a signpost to God in whom there is all security. We need to, as communities within communities, be a place of refuge and security for those who are feeling this anxiety. Our communities of Christians, in village after village after village, will be a sign and a demonstration of how we can do life fully and differently, despite the situation we're in. And I'm anticipating, as always, that that won't be just threshold people, it will be done across the Christians, denominations and any one community as far as folks welcome that. So, I want to finish with the prayer of Sir Francis Drake, who, according to my mum, was some kind of distant, very distant relative of ours. Disturb us, Lord, when we are too well pleased with ourselves, when our dreams have come true because we dream too little, because we sail too close to the shore. Disturb us, Lord, when with the abundance of things we possess, we have lost our thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, we have ceased to dream of eternity. And in our efforts to build a new earth, we've allowed our vision of the new heaven to dim. Disturb us, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on wilder seas where storm will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. We ask you to push back the horizons of our hopes and to push us into the future in strength, courage, hope and love. This we ask in the name of our Captain, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. See ya.